Welcome back to the Gateway. Thank you for joining us for Tuesday night Bible study. Yeah, we, uh, we've had a good time in the Word, haven't we, church? We always have a good time in His Word. Uh, and, and even before we get in the Word, I hope you've had a good week. I hope everything's uh, started off well. I hope that, you know, that you've had some, some good times out. You know, I know it's good to get out and walk a little bit and, and do some stuff. Uh, Cheryl and I went walking recently, and uh, it was just great to get out and walk around a little bit and, you know, just breathe some fresh air. So I hope you're doing the same and making the most of this beautiful Squim weather. Uh, and if you're watching and you're not from Squim, I hope you're having a great time wherever you're at, enjoying Jesus and enjoying uh, what you can. So thank you for being here. And so with that in mind, we're going to jump into the study. You know, normally I do a little a light review from the previous week just to kind of bring us up to speed. So I've got a, just a very small recap that I'm going to do now. So we saw last week Paul was still held in custody in Caesarea. He'd been there over two years. Um, he had never been con convicted of any crimes. Nothing, there was nothing, um, nothing, there was no reason for him to still be held in custody, however he was. And so at this point, uh, he, had, he had appealed to Caesar because he was getting no justice in that court, and they were just more or less keeping him there, and he was going to stay indefinitely. So he appealed to Caesar, and as a Roman citizen, he had that right to appeal to the emperor to stand trial there. So Paul does that. And so he's just about to depart for Rome to stand trial there. But Festus, the current governor, uh, he doesn't really have any charges or anything uh, to write down to send with Paul to the emperor. Uh, and it would it'd be quite foolish to send a prisoner to stand trial before the emperor without stating a reason for sending. So uh, Festus schedules this, this big hearing. All the prominent people from Caesarea come. I mean, you know, the King Agrippa was there, the governor Festus the prominent military, civil, uh, probably some social people of social influence, but it was the, a large gathering. Uh, and it was a hearing. Once again, this was not a trial because the trial had been rescheduled for some time whenever Paul got to Rome. So this was a hearing just to get more information to have something to write. And so as Paul's standing there, he begins talking with the group and he shares his conversion. He, he talks to the group and says, hey, I was on the road to Damascus. Um, I was going there to to persecute the Christians, and I met Jesus, and um, and he shared that whenever he met Jesus on the road, that the Lord had, after he, after he trusted Christ, the Lord actually had spoken to him and shared some of his plans for Paul's life with Paul. And then Paul also shares a little bit about what he's been doing from that moment till now. And so with that in mind, we're going to pick up in verse 22 at the last part, because last week we closed out after looking at the first part of verse 22. So let's pick up in uh, uh, Acts chapter 26, verse 22, the last part. Okay, we're getting the PowerPoint going. Thank you. Okay, and so it says, uh, it says, for I teach nothing but what Moses and the prophets have said was destined to happen, that our Messiah had to suffer and die and be the first to raise from the dead to release the bright light of truth both to our people and to the non-Jewish nations. Uh, so Paul really, I, I like he, the way he starts out this, the, the, his, his uh, speech at this hearing. He says, I teach nothing but what most of the prophets had said was destined to happen. That's a big deal. That's a big deal because Paul was not, he was not preaching some new doctrine, no, some new religion. He wasn't just going off in left field. Uh, you know, hey, I'm doing my own thing here, and I want you guys to go along with it. He said, look, I'm doing nothing at all except agreeing with what Moses said, agreeing with what the prophets wrote. I'm in agreement with all of that. I don't, I'm not doing any strange, weird thing. I'm not uh, off track. I'm just walking in the fulfillment of those promises. I'm walking in that. And so it's neat because when he says that, um, he's really saying there's no reason, there's no reason for this persecution from the Jews. There's no reason for these accusations. Uh, see, Paul was not doing anything to oppose the beliefs of the Jews. He really wasn't. He was just walking in a current now revelation of the fulfillment of those promises and of those scriptures. Um, you know, You've heard me say this before, church, but I want to say it again. You know, we live from one revelation to the next. We do, church. You know, we all, 
are, you know, we want to make the most of the now moment with Jesus and the now revelation we have. But I'm going to tell you, God will have a new revelation for you tomorrow, the next day or the next day. And that doesn't mean that the old revelation was not God. It don't mean what you're doing right now is wrong. But what it does, it just means that this revelation you've got right now is bringing you into life. It's bringing you closer to Jesus. It's adding to you. It's adding to your quality of life. And see, the next revelation will connect with this one and build upon it. It's not going to just knock it out and, and, and make it to where it was no good. What it does, it takes you deeper. It takes you farther. It takes you closer to Jesus. And so that's a big deal. Because see, Paul was actually walking in a now fulfillment of those old promises. So see, Paul was not teaching some strange thing. He was just walking in a now fulfillment of what the Jews were hanging on to, what they had hoped for. See, the, the Jewish religious leaders were actually stuck. They were stuck in yesterday's, more like yesteryear's revelation uh, because they refused to embrace the now revelation that Jesus was. Um, you know, when Jesus came, you know, their Messiah, they had been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting on their Messiah to come. And I guarantee you what happened is they had studied those prophecies and those scriptures. I mean, they knew them. But what they did, I believe, is I believe they fabricated a plan or a picture of what their Messiah had to look like. And see, we can do that, can't we? When God gives us a dream or a vision, uh, we can take that thing and we can we can paint it up and make this exact thing of what it has to look like. You know, our expectation a lot of time can, well, can can kind of, I don't know what, what you'd call it, but it can affect uh, the fulfillment of what God has for us. And so we have to be careful with that. When God gives you a dream or gives me a dream, just like he spoke to the Jews, we have to embrace the dream, embrace that revelation. But also, we don't have to get so uh, so committed to what it has to look like that we don't acknowledge God when he really comes through for us. And that's what happened with them. They were so stuck, and they had their preconceived ideas. Because, see, you know, Jesus didn't say what they wanted him to say, did he? He didn't do what they wanted him to do. So he couldn't be their Messiah because he had to look like they wanted him to look. He had to say what they wanted him to say, and he had to be what they wanted him to be. He had to be... The, the, the fulfillment of their human expectations, or he couldn't be their Messiah. So once again, be careful with God. You know, as he gives you a dream or gives you a plan or a vision, um, embrace it, move with it, but don't put God in a box because he'll fulfill it the way he wants to. And when he does, it will be bigger. It'll be grander. It'll be better than anything we thought or dreamed. So keep moving, church. Keep moving with Jesus. Um, amen. So let's pick up once again in verse 23 because there's a couple more things here. There's a lot of stuff here. All right. So I want to read what Jesus said about the law. Here we go. And this is Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, if you think I've come to set aside the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets, you're mistaken. I have come to fulfill and bring to perfection all that has been written. Same thing Paul was saying here. Jesus didn't come to just throw out the old. What he did, he came to take it to that next step, to that fulfillment, to that, that fullness and that perfection. And Jesus was. He was the, the, the perfection, the fulfillment of all those prophecies. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul said, hey, I'm not disagreeing with anything written in the, you know, written in the law or in the prophets. What I'm doing is I'm saying that all that has happened and this is what it looks like. And Jesus is saying the same thing. I am the fulfillment of all that. And let's take it a step further. In Galatians 3.24, the Bible says, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And you'll see, I, had, I left a little note there next to tutor. This is the footnote. And I want to read this. It says, in a household, the guardian responsible for the care and discipline of the children. See, this is a great picture of really what the law of Moses was about. The law of Moses, what it was for, it was our guardian. It was meant to, to care for us. It was meant to dis discipline us. It was meant to give us a quality of life and a rightness before God, but the end result was to prepare us to receive Jesus when he came. That was what the law and the prophets was about. All those writings about, about the Messiah was to prepare us, to train us, to equip us, so that when he came, we'd say, that's the one, and we'd embrace him, and we would come to faith in Christ. It and neat how you see Paul's, def Paul's defense and then you see Jesus and you see the scriptures. You know, everything from Genesis to Revelation is about Jesus, church. 
It's all about Jesus, church. Hallelujah. And so with that in mind, let's keep right on going. Amen. So in Colossians 1.18, I want to talk about one other thing. <clears throat> Is it where it says, uh, let's touch on verse 23 again. And then I want to talk about Colossians 1.18. So before I read this, we're going to look at verse 23. It says, the Messiah had suffered and died and be the first to raise from the dead. Now, I want to say something about that. You know, Jesus was technically not the first person to raise from the dead. So it's, t it's telling us something different here when it says he was the first to raise from the dead, whenever Paul states that. Uh, actually, you may, if you remember from the scripture, um, you know, Elijah raised the Shunammite's son. Jesus had raised Lazarus. Jesus had also raised the widow's son at Nain. And also, if I remember correctly, there was a dead person that actually touched Elisha's bones, and he was raised from the dead also. Um, so Jesus wasn't the first to be raised from the dead, but it says here that he was. So let's look at that. So in Colossians 1.18, it, it tells us what we're talking about here. It says that Jesus, he is also the head, the life source and leader of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, saying the same thing here Paul was saying. So that he himself will occupy the first place. He will stand supreme in the, and be preeminent in everything. Really, what it's saying, church, is that Jesus was the first one to be resurrected with an incorruptible, an immortal, a perfect, glorified body. So he was the first one to be raised like that. All these other people we're talking about, they were raised back to life, but they still died again. Jesus was the first one to be, to be literally raised in that glorified, perfect, sinless state. So that's what it's talking about here. All right, so let's go to 24, verse 24. It says, Festus interrupt Paul's defense, blurting out, you're out of your mind. All this great learning of yours is driving you crazy. Um, and I understand the governor, the, the governor Festus interrupts Paul and says, you're, you're, you, you've lost your mind, Paul. I mean, you've, you've spent too much time studying stuff. You've lost your mind. Uh, <laughs> now, and, and look at verse 25. Paul replies to him saying, no, your excellency Festus, I'm not crazy. I speak the words of truth and reason. And I want you to notice where Paul goes. Paul doesn't spend any more time responding to Festus' accusation that, that you know, Paul had lost his mind. What does he do? Paul immediately turns to King Agrippa, and he says, I know I can speak freely, frankly and freely with you, for you understand these matters well. And none of these things have escaped your notice. After all, it's not like it was a secret. So I think that Paul, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, did something really good here because you know, once again, in 24, Festus interrupts him in the middle of his defense. Um, and then Paul says, no, no, but he, he says, your excellency, no, I haven't lost my mind. So he, he gives Festus the respect and courtesy to the gut of him being a governor. But then what does he do? He immediately brings King Agrippa in as a witness. Isn't that neat? Because see, if, if Paul would have spent time trying to explain his sanity to the governor, he would have broke the flow of the Holy Spirit. He'd have broke his, his, his moment there because he was sharing the gospel. I mean, he was sharing the good news about the Messiah with this group of, of, of preeminent people. And so he didn't want to get off track with that. So what does he do? Immediately, he goes to King Agrippa, who was the, the, the most revered um, government figure in the room. So he says, King Agrippa, I know I speak frankly and freely to you. So he just rolls right off of that accusation of insanity and brings King Agrippa in as a, as a witness to these things. Very, a lot of wisdom there. You see God in that. Um, so if you understand these matters well, and none of these things have escaped your nose. After all, it's not like it was a secret. Um, big thing with that. Because, um, you know, King Agrippa, he had been in that region for many years. You know, he was a Jewish man. And he knew of the law of Moses and the writings of the prophets. Being a Jew, of course he knew that. He was raised in it. Um, but he would also have been aware of the Jewish expectation and hope of their coming Messiah because that, they talked about it. I mean, it, that was part of daily life. They were waiting. So as a Jewish man, he would know all of that. Plus, he had been a leader in that region for a long time, so he'd be very aware of those things. Another thing is Jesus. You know, this, this isn't, you know, uh, this isn't today where there's millions and millions of people in different places. Jerusalem was much smaller. Uh, they were expected to be about 50,000 inhabitants in that day in Jerusalem. And then the whole region, you know, there was not, I mean, there was, there was quite a number of people, but it wasn't like today. So you can imagine 
with Agrippa being a king and being in power, and then Jesus, what all he did, of course King Agrippa knew of Jesus. Of course King Agrippa knew of what Jesus had done and the miracles and all the things, because people talked about it. And so he knew of those things. He'd understand those matters well, as Paul said in 26. And also another thing is, I'm sure that King Agrippa was probably aware of Paul, you know, Paul, and because Paul had, you know, he was working with the Sanhedrin Council, and then he, he had this radical conversion and had been representing Christ and been uh, converting many to Christianity. So, you know, I'm sure that as a government leader in that region and also being a Jewish person, I'm sure he'd heard of Paul as well. So there's a lot of things. And, and even the way Paul speaks to him, I, I, he says, I, you know, I know I can speak frankly and freely with you. I'm, it, it just appears through these verses uh, that you'll see that Paul um, it almost seems like he he knew Agrippa or knew of Agrippa or there was something there because the way he speaks very casually and frankly with Agrippa. I mean, there was this was a king and this was a this was Paul, um, amazing. But also when he says it's not like it was a secret, all those things were big. They had changed society, had changed the world. So Agrippa would know about them, all right? And so in twenty seven, even whenever he says this in twenty six, he says, uh, "I love it." He says, he follows up in 27, says, don't you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? And then Paul actually answers. I like it. He says, don't you believe them? And then Paul says, I know you do. Isn't that cool? See, Paul had diverted the, 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 the question from the governor regarding his sanity right into uh, a witness of great influence by pulling in Agrippa. And... Um, when he says, I know that you do, I think that's just really cool. Um, because, you know, whenever Paul did that, let's pick up in verse 27, Agrippa responds and says, in, in such a short time, you are nearly persuading me to become a Christian. You know, Agrippa doesn't dispute anything Paul said. He doesn't dispute, no, wait a minute, no. Agrippa responds in such a way to where it actually confirms what Paul has said regarding Moses and the prophets, and Jesus being the fulfillment, because Agrippa didn't dispute any of that. He said, you almost, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Um, it's amazing. Um, so I really believe that when it says Agrippa was nearly persuaded to become a Christian, it doesn't, I don't know anywhere else whether it, it states whether or not Agrippa actually became a Christian, but um, but obviously Paul got, you know, a valid witness there because Agrippa actually confirmed much of what Paul was saying through this statement here. Um, but I want to say something else. Just think about all the people that nearly become Christians. You know, you're in or you're out, church. That's just the way it is with Jesus. You know, there's, you know, there isn't no, you know, there isn't, I'm nearly a Christian and I'm going to heaven. You know, so please keep that in mind. There's a lot of people say, you know, I'll wait. And even like whenever... Uh, Paul appeared uh, earlier before, uh, I forgot who it was in Acts, but uh, the person said, uh, I will call you back when I have a convenient time. I think that was Felix, the governor. But he said, he said, go away from me now. I'll call you back when I have a convenient time. How many people um, will visit with a Christian and say, hey, I'll talk about this some other time, or I'm going to take care of that right before I die, or, you know, I'll get around to that later. Um, you know, church, um, I want to say something with that. With that is we must pray more for the people we're witnessing to. We must pray more for the people we're talking to. We need to be praying more. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, because, you know, as Christians, as Christians, um, you know, no amount of intellect, no amount of Bible knowledge, no amount of speaking skills can bring someone to Jesus. You know, nothing we do can actually reach in and touch their heart and draw them to the cross. None. And so Paul says in verse 29, he says, I pray to God that both you and those here listening to me would one day become the same as I am, except the course without these chains. And that's just what I'm talking about. Is Paul, he didn't try to, to, to push anything. He said, I pray for you. I pray that God will touch your life. I pray that God will draw you to the cross. And that's actually a big thing because um, only the Father draws people. Let's see in John 6, 44. It says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, giving him the desire to come to me, and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. 
So church, no amount of speaking, no amount of uh, talking, no amount of pushing, prodding, or anything can accomplish what prayer will when it comes to someone's soul. Pray for people, church. Pray and keep on praying. Like the Bible says, knock and keep on knocking, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking. Uh, pray for those, those lost people. Pray for those people that you come in contact with. You know, pray before you go out to visit with people. Pray for God to draw them to him, to his, for Father to draw them to his son. You know, God, pray. I mean, just pray. We have to pray and talk to God about these things. Um, because once again, on our best day, we can't really do anything with someone's heart. But Father can. So pray. So we're just close to about to wrap up church. So let's go just a little bit more. So here we go. Here, our last three verses. It says the king, the governor, Bernice. The king, the governor, Bernice, and the others got up. As they were leaving the chamber, they commen commented one to another, this man has done nothing that deserves death or even imprisonment. Um, it's really neat because these leaders, all these leaders, came to this conclusion after listening to the accusations of the Jews. They listened to Paul's defense. They had actually read the original report um, from the Roman commander Lysias whenever he sent Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea. So they had that report. They also had the testimony of the previous governor, Felix, the current governor, Festus, and the, the uh, report from King Agrippa. So they had all that information and all of it together said so this man hadn't done anything wrong. Nothing. Paul was not convicted of anything, um, yet he had to go stand trial. But listen there, in verse 32, and this is our final verse, says, King Agrippa said to Festus, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, he could have been released. Now I want to just kind of close with some thoughts on that. Um, didn't God know that they were going to release Paul? Of course he did. Yet Paul appealed to Caesar. Was Paul not following God and not following the Holy Spirit? Of course he was. He was following God all the way through this. It says in a couple places that Paul, by the Holy Spirit, was saying things. But So we know Paul, the man of God, was following the Holy Spirit's lead, yet he appealed to Caesar. God knew that he could have been set free, but you know what I, I think happened here? Amen. I think this is good. You know, remember, Paul had called, been called by God to go to other nations, and Italy was one of those. Um, I really think that the bottom line is God was giving Paul free transportation to Rome at the government's expense. I mean, you can see it in here. I mean, Paul was following God, and God knew that he was going to be let go, but guess what? Paul would have had a little more difficulty getting to Italy, wouldn't he? But now the government's going to pay for it. And not only that, Paul was going to have a detachment of Roman soldiers protecting him all the way there. Isn't that great? And he would, he would go and stand before the emperor in Rome, and then he would go to those other nations, which was part of the call on his life. All of that was facilitated by the Lord. So no matter what's going on in your life, even when things might look strange or dark or you just might be unsure, hey, just know that God's with you. And he is ordering your steps. And he's going to enlist the resources of the world. He'll, you know, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. He'll bring in whatever's necessary to make sure you have what you need to go where he's calling you to go, church. So with that in mind, let's pray and close out this week. Lord, we love you. God, thank you that, Lord, even as we saw with Paul, God, you give us opportunities to represent you. You give us opportunities, Lord, to share your love and grace. And God, you, you always watch out for us, God. You always take care of us no matter what. And Lord, you'll see that, you'll see that we finish our course, Lord, with you and, and, and bless you and honor you and honor people as long as we keep our heart right, Lord. That's, that's it. Just keep our heart right and keep walking and keep moving with you. And Lord, bless the people who are watching. Encourage and strengthen them where they're at, Lord. God, just, just show yourself strong in everyone's life who's watching this. Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we will see you next week for Bible study. Bye-bye.